My name is Ottaviano Canuto, and I'm a senior fellow at the Policy Center for the New South. This is the seventh of a series of short videos dealing with subjects covered in my recent book, Climbing the High Ladder Development in the Global Economy. Today, we approach the evolution of a current account imbalance in the global economy and the consequent accumulation of uh, foreign assets and liabilities among major economies. Global current Im account imbalance have diminished in the recent past, but they remain relevant. Since 2012, the IMF has published annual assessments of the current account balance and the external positions, that is to say, stocks of foreign assets, minus liabilities, of systemically significant economies. Those reports offer country-specific evaluations of whether current account balance and real exchange rates are aligned with a set of variables treated as their fundamentals. As you can see in the chart, after peaking in 2007 at around 6% of world GDP, global current account imbalances declined to 3% of world GDP in 2018. In the 2000s, there was a fierce debate on whether the rising current account imbalance that you can see in the chart were pointing to some sort of a sudden stop of capital flows and some sort of financial crisis. But discussions about large current account imbalances among systemically relevant economies as a direct threat to the stability of the global economy vanished in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. As the global financial crisis originated in the US financial system, followed by a second dip in the Eurozone and global imbalance diminished in following years, the issue faded into the background. The overall stable landscape underwent changes in composition. China's current account surpluses have gradually diminished, as we saw in our video on China's rebalancing, while Japan and Eurozone debtor countries have moved in the opposite direction. Below the line, in the case of debt countries, the US remained the major case. Emerging market economies have displayed divergent trajectories. Brazil, India, Indonesia, Mexico, and South Africa have left the fragile position of the taper tantrum in 2013, an episode that will be approached later in this series, while Argentina joined Turkey in that zone. Asymmetric macroeconomic policy stance among advanced economies since 2013 have affected the evolution of balance. While some economies have combined large surpluses and weak domestic demand, Germany, Japan, Netherlands, the United Kingdom and the United States exhibited stronger recoveries in their domestic demands. In any way, we see in the chart that the global financial crisis divides the evolution of global imbalance in two states, before and afterward. Let me call attention to two distinctive yet combined processes that were at the core of the era of the global imbalance up to the global financial crisis. On the one hand, credit-driven, asset-bobo-led growth in the US, along with wealth effects, intensified the existing trend of domestic absorption particularly consumption, growing faster than GDP. This resulted in falling personal saving rates and increasing current account debts in the first phase of rising global imbalance, as you can see in the chart. Remember the evolution toward the big balance sheet economy that we approached in the fifth video of this series. On the other hand, the accelerated structural transformation and rapid growth in China that we all also have approached in a previous video, led to high and rising savings and investments and produced ever larger current account surpluses in that period until the gradual rebalancing after the global financial crisis. 
but don't take too far the link of those combined processes. They are often linked as mirror images of each other. Ben Bernanke, former Fed governor, once referred to an Asian savings glut as causing low interest rates and asset price hikes in the US. Whereas in fact, the US asset bubbles were more strongly associated with the excess elasticity of the international monetary and financial system, as Claudio Borio and Piti Dizia Tat from the BIS named it. Global current account imbalances cannot be blamed for the US originated global financial crisis. The flows that mattered for the US asset bubbles were not the net flows of capital from the rest of the world that financed America's current account best. Rather, they were the gross flows of finance from the US to Europe that allowed European banks to leverage their balance sheets, automatically followed by large matching flows of money from European banks into toxic US subprime linked securities without ever leaving the US. Asset bubbles in the US to a great extent were blown by European banks through their balance sheets by channeling US money market funds into toxic assets. Not the only ones, but definitely the European banks are a part of that story. From the US Europe balance of payments standpoint, short term outflows from Europe to the US were netted out by simultaneous long term flows in the opposite direction. Close to zero net capital flows had a lot of financial intermediation and asset bubble expansion via banks' balance sheets. In the parallel can be traced within the Eurozone itself, including the Eurozone experience uh, later on with the second dip of the global financial crisis. The creation of the Euro as a common currency was followed by a risk premium convergence within the zone toward German levels and to cross-border banking flows with extremely easy conditions. Consequent asset bubbles led to wealth effects and excess domestic absorption besides inflated financial intermediation in Southern Europe and Ireland, leading to the subsequent debt crisis. The pattern of intra-Eurozone current account imbalance was primarily a consequence of the euphoria taking place under conditions of the excess elasticity of the Eurozone's financial system. The commodity super cycle also helped shape global imbalances in, in that period. However, it was to a great extent the consequence of extraordinary global growth prior to the crisis in which Commodity intensive emerging market economies maintain growth trends above those of advanced economies. That's the third price shock that we have already highlighted in the series as shifting tectonic plates of the global economy. And we, and, and we will approach that later in this series. So global imbalance did not spark a crisis and have returned in a different configuration with smaller magnitudes. Let me illustrate this that I'm saying by looking at two uh, uh, groups uh, of systemically relevant economies. And, and through looking at the, the continuation uh, of uh, rising surpluses on the side of these groups, one can see some continuation of global imbalance. In the Eurozone, Deaths in debtor countries have shrunk in tandem with the maintenance of surpluses in creditor countries, slightly increasing in the case of Germany. So while the net foreign asset position liabilities of debtor countries in the Eurozone has not diminished as much, their current account adjustment has added to the story in surpluses the Eurozone has run with the rest of the world. And as you can see in the chart, Brian Setzer, then from uh, the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, called attention to how the six major East Asian surplus economies, China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, China, Hong Kong, China, and Singapore, had reversed their post 
global financial crisis surplus declines. And by 2015, we're topping even the Eurozone, as you can see. So to some extent, the era of global imbalance is not entirely over, even if with different global magnitudes. Well, since current account balances are neither expected nor desired to be zero, how can we assess whether they are too much? To those who have voiced concern over rising surpluses in East Asia and the Eurozone have a point. To answer these questions, it will be useful to look at the IMF's exercise of a judgment over whether global imbalance have been in excess, that is to say, inconsistent with fundamentals and desirable policies. C. National economies are not expected to exhibit zero current account balance and zero stocks of net foreign assets. In any period, domestic absorption, that is to say consumption and investment, can be larger or smaller than local GDP, triggering inflows or outflows of capital due to fundamental factors. Uh, fundamental factors. Countries differ in intertemporal preferences and age strictures of their populations. And that means different ratios of domestic consumption to GDP. Also, differences in opportunities for investment also tend to lead to capital flows. Furthermore, differences in institutional development levels, reserve currency status, and other idiosyncratic features also generate capital flows and imbalance. Besides that, cyclical factors, including fluctuations in commodity price, may also cause transitory increases and declines in balance. And countries' outstanding stocks of net foreign assets also have a counterpart in terms of service payments in their current accounts. So uh, the natural is to expect a configuration of uh, surpluses and deficits. When global imbalance and the corresponding real effective exchange rates reflect such fundamentals, economies are in a better place than they would be in autarky, isolated with zero balance. So the presence of current account deficits or surpluses is not necessarily a bad thing, and zero balance is not optimal. There are situations, however, in which such imbalance may be gauged as excessive and countries should reduce them. There is the straightforward case of imbalance being magnified by domestic distortions, the removal of which would benefit the economy directly. This is the case, for instance, when deficits are higher because lacks financial regulation, fuels, unsustainable credit booms, or excessively loose fiscal policies. It is also the case of surpluses that reflect extremely high private savings due to lack of social insurance or investments being curbed because of a lack of efficient financial intermediation. And two other conceivable situations in which surpluses can be deemed as excessive are, one, when current account surpluses are the result of deliberate strategies to curb domestic demand in deliberate exchange rate undervaluation, crowding out foreign competitors. And also, too, when an increase in one economy's surplus takes place while others face difficulties in absorbing it without suffering adverse durable effects on their demand and output. It is worth noting in asymmetry in adjustments by surplus and deficit countries. While excessive deaths eventually face a shortage of external finance, surpluses suffer less automatic pressure to dissipate and can therefore persist for longer. Not by chance, in the discussions at Bretton Woods prior to the launch of the IMF and the World Bank, John Maynard Keynes insisted on having norms requiring both surplus and deficit countries' sides in the correction of external deaths. Well, uh, visiting then the, the assessment by the IMF, uh, which has shown that real effective exchange rates, 
and current account gaps have remained significant. Now, it's been uh, for nine years that the IMF, uh, through its external sector report, has offered assessments comparing actual current account balance in real effective exchange rates with those that would reflect medium-term fundamentals and desired policies. That is to say, we are not no longer looking simply at the size of the, the, the current account imbalance, but trying to gauge to what extent they are excessive or not vis-a-vis -vis a set of fundamentals. And the chart displays the IMF 2020 assessment, the, late, the last one, the latest one, of how intensively individual economies have exhibited current accounts and real effective exchange rates, which reflect that, that are out of line with their fundamentals. That is to say, those features that would normally lead them to feature a current account imbalance within certain estimate country-specific ranges. In this case, a stronger corresponds to real effective exchange rates under valuation while weaker corresponds to real effective exchange rates over valuation. So stronger or weaker also means that our current account balance is larger or smaller than that consistent with fundamentals and desirable policies. And countries may be classified in three broad groups. For instance, this assessment from, from 2020 uh, has 10 economies exhibiting positive gaps between actual and fundamentals. Uh, that is to say, current account balance that are stronger than the levels consistent with medium term fundamentals and desirable policies. The, uh, the Euro area is there, Germany, Malaysia, the Netherlands, Singapore, and Thailand, which have been there for most of or all of the years since the first IMF exercise of this type in 2012. While you have nine economies with negative gaps between actual and fundamentals consistent levels of current accounts, that is to say, they display current account balance weaker than the level consistent with medium term fundamentals and desirable policies. You see there Belgium, Canada, the United Kingdom, the United States, and some emerging market economies, Argentina, South Africa, as well as commodity exporters, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, and France joined this group in 2019. And then you have 11 economies showing actual current account balance broadly in line with the level consistent with medium term fundamentals and desirable policies. In 2018, uh, you had there Australia, China, Hong Kong, uh, SAR, India, Italy, Japan and Mexico. Whereas Indonesia, Korea, Russia, and Spain entered this category in 2019. All in all, the IMF assesses that about 40% of global imbalance were excessive in 2019. That corresponds to 1.2% of world GDP. Notwithstanding the gradual moderation of overall excess global current account imbalance since 2013, their long-standing persistence leading to stocks of assets and liabilities at historically high levels implied vulnerabilities on the eve of the 2020 global pandemic. In our view, although not fueling fears of a collapse in major financial flows, Global imbalance have not gone away as an issue. They reveal that the global economic recovery may have been subpar because of asymmetric excess surpluses in some countries and below potential output in many others. The end of the era of global imbalance may have been called too early. In Lord Keynes' argument about the asymmetry of adjustments between deficit and surplus economies remains stronger than ever. There is also something important to highlight about the search for the demand for net safe assets. Cross-border net acquisition of safe assets tends to be augmented. Several authors 
have highlighted an excess of demand over supply of assets considered as safe as one of the factors behind declining long-term interest rates in advanced economies. In addition to the secular stagnation hypothesis and the big balance sheet economy that we discussed in the previous video, one may also include the increased search for safe assets. There are even those who refer to it as a safe asset trap. And supply and demand for safe assets also bring consequence to global imbalance. As we referred uh, before, the IMF methodology to gauge current account balance associated to fundamentals includes the reserve currency status of a country when applicable. And the chart shows that country level mismatches between supply and demand for safe assets appear in the evolution of corresponding net stocks of foreign safe assets. Therefore, current account imbalance are bound to also reflect the evolution of the word stock of safe assets, rising whenever the demand for such assets also moves up. While the pandemic brought havoc on the global economy, it has probably not changed the picture of global current account imbalance. One must pay attention, however, to how the post-coronavirus economic and geopolitical world may carry consequence to supply and demand for foreign safe assets. So in a nutshell, the current account imbalance in the global economy have never left entirely the spotlight, albeit with a different configuration from that which marked the trajectory prior to the global financial crisis. This is not because they threaten global financial stability, but mainly because they reveal asymmetries in adjustment and post global financial crisis recovery between surplus and deficit economies. And because of the risk of sparking waves of trade protectionism. Also, they reveal the subpar performance of the global economy in terms of foreign gun product and employment, that is to say, a post-crisis global economic recovery below its optimum. Should any change in that scenario be expected because of the pandemic crisis? COVID-19 brought a negative shock to the global economy, but it will not change substantially the configuration of current account imbalance. You will find the discussion on this video content, that is to say, why and how the global economy remains unbalanced in chapter seven of my book that you can find on those places on the slide. In the next video, we will approach financial globalization. Stay tuned.